fascinating um, presentation to follow. I'm trying to link in the sexuality to this panel, but also to the greater discussion. The main question is uh, that we're always asked is what does sexuality or sex have to do with the internet? And indeed, as the devil's advocate asked us to earlier, what does it have to do with anything when uh, there are such pressing issues in the world? Um, so we, at uh, APC, we have a women's program. The women's program has a project on sexuality called Erotics, which is an acronym for exploratory research on ICTs and sexuality. <coughs> <laughs> and the funny thing is when they, make, when they made a bank transfer to my uh, account in Lebanon for the first research I did, it said Erotics work. And so the <laughs> bank went into panic. <laughs> And so I got involved because for, the, for a very long time, since the 90s, I've been doing gay rights organizing that was often uh, secretive and underground. And of course, the internet was a very natural part of the work that we did. And so when I met um, uh, Jack from APC at one of the conferences, and she said, oh, we're doing this research that wants to understand this relationship, I said, of course, there's a very clear relationship. You can ask any queer organizer anywhere in the world from the 90s and the 2000s, did you use the internet? And they will say, absolutely, it was crucial. And perhaps this is why uh, gay identity politics have become so pronounced and so internationalized, and the rainbow flag is such a such a clear international standard, different than other movements that started maybe before the internet had such a, a copy-paste sort of format, which is, um, I think, a lot does a lot more harm than it does good, but uh, that's another discussion. I want to talk about, in specific, the relationship of sex and sexuality to the internet. Um, and my theory has always been that the internet was primarily all about sex, in the same way that it's made up of cats, and in the same way that people um, uh, sort of used the internet in the early days for the craziest, weirdest experimentation of social interactions. You remember the days of the dungeons and the mods and the times where you could create any sort of identity, really. Um, such fun times they were. Um, <laughs> They said a lot about us as humans trying to understand each other and trying to uh, experiment with sexuality. My very first few encounters with the internet had a lot to do with sex. I remember the first time I downloaded a chat program. It was called Freetel. Did anyone use Freetel? Yes. It was this strange program where you log in and you just get thousands and thousands of usernames and you can just click on one and say hello. And I was so excited, of course, I wanted to find some other lesbian somewhere in the world. I had never met one. Um, and I kept searching until I came across um, a nickname that was lesbian for you. And I was, <laughs> <laughs> I was so happy. Um, I clicked on it, of course. And I was, well, I was young. I was like 14, 15. I was quite, um, you know, the, I didn't have a lot of information about sex or about sexuality because my only source was the encyclopedia my mom would buy from the traveling salesman and which she paid in installments over for many years so when I actually bought the Encyclopedia Britannica I didn't tell her that we could now have all this encyclopedia on one CD-ROM because it would have broken her heart <laughs> um, but anyway the access to sexuality information was very limited so for a lot of queers it was the first place that you went to and for a lot of you know non-queers people who were just thinking about their desires and their fantasies and asking the question am I normal do other people think of this? Does this make me a bad person? Um, I started a website a while ago called Ask About It, which was specifically for teenagers to ask questions about sex. Because I think the necessity to ask questions always, is always there for, for young people, even if there's information, because they don't actually trust what they Google. Or maybe they don't know what to filter out out of all the Google answers. And I got thousands and thousands of, of young people, mostly boys, asking me questions about sex. And the most popular question was, of course, um, can you guess the most popular question from boys? <laughs> no, not ASL. Size. This is the 2010. So. Size related? Mm, no, no. Boys. <laughs> <laughs> boys are still growing at this stage. What do they ask about most? They ask the question, is masturbation normal? So some variation of, will, will masturbation hurt me? And so I got tired of answering the same question, and I was answering anonymously, so I had to every time log out and then answer, blah, blah. And so I put a big banner on the website that said, masturbation's normal, stop asking. <laughs> <laughs> 
and I detail, there's absolutely nothing wrong with it. Here are the links, you know, whatever the myths are, you grow horns and you grow things and you, grow, you lose your, I don't know. So many myths from like different uh, cultures. Um, but still the questions kept coming because people need to ask, right? They need to interact with someone, they need to get an answer. The second most popular question, I'll tell you uh, later, to do sort of a cliffhanger that I stole from <laughs> Michonne's presentation. But so anyway, back to the important thing. Um, I think the, the people ask this question, what, why is sexuality important and what's the big deal? I think when people advocate for the human right to have great sex and wonderful sex, which includes uh, access to information about sexuality, the ability to experiment safely, women's ability to express themselves sexually and to express what they want, which is certainly something, as you know, the internet has helped a lot when women were able to uh, blog anonymously or speak anonymously or read each other's experiences. And I cite here the wonderful African blog, um, Agent Adventures from um, the Bedroom, I think it's called. Ad it's adventuresfrom.com, run by uh, Nana, which is uh, this wonderful blog about really um, uh, exposed uh, sexual feelings and vulnerabilities and experiences. And if we are only to look at, so let's forget our right to have great sex. Yeah, let's say it's not important compared to our right to eat food or have shelter. And this is really a secondary sort of thing. What's the big deal about it? But if we look at the money and the investment and the power put into regulating sex in our lives, then we ask ourselves again, you know, it must be a huge deal. If like all these institutions, these religious institutions are built on the foundation that we must regulate women's sexualities, there must be something therefore extremely powerful about women's sexualities, right? I don't know what it is, but it must be. <laughs> something so liberating and so freeing and so fundamentally changing of our lives that all these forces are invested in controlling it, yeah? Otherwise, who cares? You know, we've got condoms, we've got birth control, let people have sex all they want. Why are we so obsessed with controlling it? And why are we still obsessed with controlling queer or marginalized or invisible sexualities? Yeah? Why does it cause, it cause us panic, this moral panic? Which I've been feeling a little bit in these discussions, there's also a panic around, we gave them internet and they use it for sex or games. You know, we brought them technology, it's supposed to lift these economies out of poverty, but instead they use it for sexting, and I don't know what. <laughs> so, and so you can imagine that the problem we're dealing with is a, mo is a, is a panic uh, that uses sexuality to censor and regulate almost all information that governments or religious authorities or conservative uh, right-wing groups consider offensive con content. So this is always what we can test, right? What is offensive to children? Very difficult question. Child pornography, children's access to porn. And I'm not a parent, um, and uh, a lot of parents I speak to are really struggling with this question. I don't know what to do about my kid. Access. I don't want them to see things that might be harmful, right? Because we're not sure. We're not sure what's harmful. We're not sure what's good. We want them to have access to good sexual information, but yet we're not sure is this appropriate for their age, etc. Uh, and of course, our opponents can merely have to come and say pedophilia, and they've won the argument, right? And so, to, to counter encryption and Tor and privacy and all these wonderful tools that are trying to protect us, they come in and say they protect the criminals. Look, the police just found, I don't know, this guy using Google uh, to trade, uh, remember the story just came out, to, child, to trade child porn photos, therefore Google has the right, of course, to log into your email. Um, and this was uh, the same criticism of a lot of, of social networks. And so the, the funding directed from the United States in particular with the USA ID funding to a lot of cyber police units around the world, and I was called into an investigation in the uh, police unit that handles cybercrime in Lebanon because I'm being sued for something that I posted on Facebook. And I went in and as, as I was waiting for the detective, I could see huge panels from the American embassy that said, you know, sec online security. What is a proxy? What is a firewall? What is Facebook? What is a share? What is a tweet? What is blah, blah, blah. And so with this money that comes, these millions of dollars, come child protection software. Yeah, so the TRAs and all the countries start to organize conferences for societies to be able to uh, uh, regulate 
or to teach them how to regulate this content and to create more of panic about this content. And when you're not informed, of course, you're going to pa panic extra about what children are going to see, right? Um, uh, but to go back to the... the so to go back to what our struggle is, so we've been working with sexual rights activists in different places around the world to try and understand how they use the internet, how they face the challenges of content regulation, and how um, they deal with uh, personal risks and violence. So we've got these many instruments that we use. We did this lit review, we did in-depth country research. You can find this on erotics.apc.org. And we run a global survey every year uh, to try and understand the risks that are faced. And from this global survey, the interesting data that came out is that 99% of the sexual rights activists think the internet is imperative for the work that they do, so they think it's absolutely crucial. Um, over half of them, around 51% said that they've experienced threats, uh, hate mail, um, violent messages on any one of the platforms uh, because of the work that they do. And, a lot, and there were different responses as to who's, regula who's regulating this content and who's deciding what is harmful and what is not. And so our task now becomes the difficult task of trying to offer an explanation of what we think is harmful content and why. I don't think we will use the term harmful content because it's difficult. And we struggle also with the term pornography um, because, you know, I'm generally a huge uh, supporter of sexual expression uh, the line of what is pornography and what is not, who is it hurting? Is it a labor issue? Do we need to make sure that actors are getting paid? Is it a place where oppressions are amplified? So you see race play out in mainstream porn. You see this movement that's a mostly a white women's movement to get feminist porn out on the internet, queer porn, which I think is the worst porn I've ever seen. <laughs> uh, but that's my personal taste. I don't know if it's constructed, but really, if you want to make queer porn, make it a bit you know, less realistic, because porn is not realistic, right? <laughs> we don't watch porn <laughs> to watch actual sex. <laughs> um, and so there's the, there are all these questions about realities, about fantasies, about what's harmful, what's not. And what's amazing about the internet is that it amplifies and caricatures all of these issues, so it helps us not only to think about what happens online, but to think about how we understand misogyny and patriarchy. And the m most recent attacks, you might have heard about these attacks on Emma Watson because of the speech. That's uh, the he for she speech, which wasn't even such a great speech, but it got so <laughs> popular because it reached such a mainstream audience. And the threats towards her from the trolls and from the, uh, and then this you know company that sort of created this. So anyway, but it's not important. Um, I wanted to, to say one last thing before I end, um, is that, you know, as a person of, of um, who identifies as a gender queer and confused sort of person, um, I remember in the early days of the internet, there were so many opportunities to construct gender differently. Yeah, there are so many wonderful ways in which you could log in and pretend to be something or not, and pretend to be a boy, and pretend to be a girl, or pretend to be a, a unicorn, or pretend to be a, <laughs> a trans sort of person. And there was all these forums to discuss this. Of course, there was violence that came with it, and there was some risks that came with it, but you managed, right? Now, on the other hand, uh, we fast forward to 20 years later, we've got Facebook giving us 52 options for your gender identity, and we've celebrated that. Yeah, all these trans activists around the world are, are, you know, what an amazing company Facebook is because now it doesn't mind what gender you choose as long as you put it into a box and you still use your real name, then you're free to say I am whatever. You know, I'm sure they've got this data coding that still classifies you into like male or female depending on the posts <laughs> that you put and they can sort of read you. Uh, but just to say is that this is where we are now with this extremely privatized, corporatized and privately owned and structured a neoliberal sort of uh, identity politics that the internet was never supposed to be about. Yeah, so that's sort of something I wanted to put out there to end with.